evening, and um, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, I am uh, Dr. Suze Kundi. I am just waiting for my slides to, oh, oh, preview. <laughs> preview again. Um, so I am indeed a nanoscientist, which means that I can stand right in front of the projector and I'm the only person in our lineup of speakers that will not block the slides behind me. <laughs> I am on brand. So much so, that's how much I believe in nanoscience. I used to be six foot two. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't believe me? Oh. Just concentrated, it's fine. Um, so what, what is nano, first of all? Because a lot of people have this big fear about nanotechnology. Um, and I think it's mostly just because we don't know enough about it. Maybe that's partly our fault as scientists, that we don't communicate that enough. But there is a huge army of us that are trying, so please do speak to us and we'll create this dialogue. So nanotechnology is based on science that is within the nano range. So a nanometer is a billionth of a meter. So it's lots and lots of zeros. But it's a little bit difficult to get your head around that kind of size. So I have a little comparison here. So if we take the average nanoparticle and compare that to a size of the football, you would be in the same kind of size comparison as comparing said football, if that were a nanoparticle, to the size of the Earth. So it's, it's sort of incomprehensibly tiny. Um, so we're not talking tiny robots necessarily. Sometimes we can look at really small machines, but they tend to be things like viruses, which do fall in the nano range. But actually, what we tend to do is engineer different materials on this nano scale, because that gives rise to a whole host of new properties of that bulk material. So this is the kind of scale that we're looking at. So we're going down a factor of 10 each time here. We're starting with a meter rule up at the top. So that's a meter. If we go down by a factor of 10, we've got 10 centimetres, that's about the size of a bird. Go down another 10 centimetres, we're looking at, um, sorry, 10 centimetres, factor of 10, about a centimetre, which is about the size of an ant. We're going down and down and down and down, and the nano region is all around here. So we're looking at viruses, we're looking at DNA, we are looking at clusters of atoms as well. Not atoms themselves, because they are a little bit tinier still, but we're looking at this kind of range. Now, why do we care? Well, the reason that we engineer on this tiny scale is because when things are very small, they misbehave. Or at least that's what I always told my parents. It's not <laughs> my fault. I'm just following a whole new set of rules, and those rules are quantum. So quantum mechanics kind of make sense of how things misbehave. They don't really fall in line with classical mechanics as we know and love them all around us. Um, and we can kind of make use of these amazing properties that they can display by following this whole new set of rules. So I'm going to take something that we're quite familiar with, a material that we're very familiar with, and tell you a little bit about how scientists are engineering this material to create a whole new range of materials with different properties. So I've got some polymorphs of carbon here. I've got carbon in its diamond form, because it's specifically Tiffany and Gadrian ring form, because why not? Um, and I've got a very meta picture of a pencil drawn in pencil. So. <laughs> That's graphite. Now, these are all polymorphs of carbon. The only difference here is the arrangement of these carbon atoms. So in the graphite that we've got here in that pencil, the, uh, the carbon atoms in there are all holding hands with three other carbon atoms. Now, they kind of want to be as far apart from each other as possible. So they create these very flat sheets. And these sheets can run past one another, slide past one another, and that's how we can deposit some of that material onto a paper. It's an incredibly soft material. It's a kind of dull gray color. Completely differently, we've got carbon. It's made of the same building blocks, but these building blocks are arranged slightly differently, so each of these is holding hands with four other carbon atoms. Now, again, they want to be as far apart from each other as possible, and so they create these sort of tetrahedral structures that all join up together to form this. It's a very sort of 3D rigid structure. And this is what gives rise to time. diamond's incredibly tough properties, the fact that light interacts with it quite differently, so it's very sparkly. It's a completely different material. So you would think that if we pitted these two up against one another in a fight, Diamond would obviously win because it's really tough. But actually, the graphite holds a secret because we can isolate just one of these layers to get an entirely new material. 
and that is graphene. So graphene is a nanomaterial. You can see there's lots and lots of carbon atoms joined up together, but because one of its dimensions is in the nano range, we can call it a nanomaterial. So it is a material that only exists in two dimensions, because as soon as you have a second layer, that is technically no longer graphene. So that's quite cool. Now, it's a little bit tough to handle, but you can layer this stuff up, and you can create laminated sort of graphene, pyrolytic graphite. So if you were to get graphene, layer some of it up to about the thickness of cling film, it is so strong, sort of over 200 times stronger than steel, that it would be enough to support the weight of an elephant. Now, I was really lucky to be able to do that experiment <laughs> A couple of years ago, at the Royal Institution, this was Princess Fluffles making her scientific debut at the RI. She loved it. God, she hogged the stage. <laughs> so this is graphene. Graphene is really strong, but it also has other amazing properties. Because of the fact that it is incredibly ordered, these flat sheets are very ordered, and they're not kind of holding hands with anyone either side, they can conduct heat and electricity incredibly efficiently along the plane. So you can get some of this stuff, this pyrolytic graphite, hold it against an ice cube, and it will start to melt through it like a hot knife through butter. Your fingertips will feel really cold, and that's because it's conducting the heat away from your fingers right to the edge of the ice where it just slots through. It is the weirdest feeling. Um, I think I have some in my handbag, so if we can get some ice um, at the end of the show, I will demo it. No, really, never look through my handbag. There was a blowtorch in there the other day. <laughs> oh, you think I'm joking. <laughs> so... With this graphene, then, we can start to wrap it around itself and create these sort of carbon nanotubes. Weave a few of them together, you can get carbon fiber. Cap the ends, and you're getting teeny tiny test tubes, so you can start to do chemistry on the nano scale. If you start to wrap them around themselves completely, you get these little football shapes. Now, they're not for the, you know, nanobot Champions League final, but they're really, really important materials. So that material over there is Buckminster Fullerene. There are 60 carbon atoms in it, arranged very much like a football, in hexagons and pentagons. Now, the great thing about this is that they can, they can be used for very targeted drug delivery. At the moment, we treat things like cancer with a kind of all-over approach, chemotherapy and radiotherapy. So we are treating good cells as well as bad cells. Now, just to get to those bad cells, if we can start to encase the, med the medicine within these, put little markers on them and send them into the body so that when these markers reach the bad cells, they know to open up and deliver the drug exactly where it's needed. So this is all from carbon, one material, but by manipulating it on a nanoscale, we can do amazing things with it. So this is nanotechnology, and people think that nanotech is quite new. Well, it's not that new. One great science communicator, Richard Feynman, actually wrote a book about nanomaterials, tiny machines, he called them, um, back in 1959. But they are even older than that. In fact, nanotechnology has been around forever. So the work that I am an expert in is an area called artificial photosynthesis. Plants have been doing this for billions of years. So plants capture sunlight energy and use it to make their own fuel in the form of glucose. Now, we don't want to make glucose, but what we do want to make is something quite different. So we use this system, particularly a section from Photosystem 2, as inspiration of how we can solve the world's energy crisis, obviously. So all we're doing is using sunlight energy, capturing it, and using it to split water. So when you split water, you can make these sort of component parts turn into their gases. So you get hydrogen and you get oxygen. Now what we do is we collect that hydrogen and we can use it as a fuel. So you can burn it directly. You can release three times the amount of energy that you would from methane. And the great thing about it is when you burn it, all it does is recombine with oxygen, so you get water again. So it's really nice and sustainable. Now, it can't do it by itself, because otherwise you'd leave a glass of water out in the sunshine and come back 10 minutes later to a rather explosive mix of materials sat on top of it. So thankfully, it can't do it by itself, but we do use a middleman. So this is titanium dioxide. It's a really cheap material, but we use a really nano-thin, about sort of 100, 200 nanometer thin film of it to capture that sunlight energy and push that onto those water molecules. 
So like I said, all you do is you get water at the end of it. It's a really nice, sustainable cycle. And the great thing about this is that it is a great way to use solar energy as a resource. We are looking at things like tidal energy and wind energy, but none of those are very reliable. However, even on the greyest of days, we are not sat in the dark here. We can guarantee that there is sunlight energy reaching us. In fact, there's an amazing factoid where the amount of sunlight reaching the Earth in one hour is enough to meet current global energy demands for an entire year. Now, a lot of that is quite difficult to capture, so we're not going to capture all of it, but this could be a really good way of using some of that solar energy without putting any of those solar panels on our roofs. So hopefully, in a few years' time, we'll all be able to fill our cars up with water instead of petrol, saving us all money for shoes or other things that you want to buy. That's entirely up to you. Might be shoes for me, though. Now, like I said, this isn't new. There is nanotechnology in nature all around us. Recently, a company managed to perfect and commercialize an adhesive that is based on gecko feet. So geckos are amazing little animals. They defy gravity and not in the wicked way. They manage to crawl up walls and they can climb on ceilings and they don't fall off, but they don't leave a sticky residue. Their feet are covered in these tiny, tiny microscopic hairs. And it's because of the tiny forces that these hairs kind of interact with the surface with. They're really weak on their own, but as an army of nano hairs, they are able to grip onto almost any surface, wet or dry, and they don't leave any kind of sticky residue. But that's not the only place we see them. You know, geckos are just one thing. We have nanostructures in nature that allow desert beetles to kind of collect their own water, condense their own water in the middle of a really dry, arid environment. We've got lotus leaves that are displaying super hydrophobic properties. Water hates to be on those leaves. And so they kind of bead off and roll off, giving rise to, you know, really awesome waterproof gear for us, which we definitely need in this country. Give it a week, it's going to start raining again. You've got things like Velcro that were inspired by nanostructures in nature, burr that will stick to almost anything. And you've got things like shark skin that are engineered in such a way by nature to cut through the water with really minimal drag. And we can use these things as inspiration for things as basic as swimsuits. So nanotechnology has filtered your lives in ways you probably don't realize, but hopefully will have more of an appreciation of when you leave here today. So the reason that I love what I do is because I think it enables anyone to be a superhero. I love my superheroes. And through material science, you can become invisible. You can start to engineer on a nano scale to create materials that can bend light around you to make you invisible. You can be super tough and powerful using things like artificial muscle based on some of the carbon fibers that we saw earlier. You can do all of these things through science and engineering. The reason that Tony Stark, or Iron Man, is my favorite superhero is because he wasn't bitten by a spider, he wasn't in a horrific accident, he got his superpowers because he was curious and he was a good scientist and a good engineer. So hopefully, through science and nanotech particularly, I am quite enjoying becoming a superhero. Hopefully you guys will take that on board as well. Maybe you guys will also be superheroes if you are not already. Thank you so much. I hope you've had a great day. See you later.